Every day the figures are a troubling reminder. Australia is still grappling with health and economic challenges due to COVID-19. A wave of new cases is now upon us. Victoria is at the epicentre and today South Australia recorded new cases for the first time in more than a month. On the jobs front, the number of people without work is mounting. The latest sector to receive some relief is the arts. So did the government get its package right? You've got lots of questions, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. I'm filling in for Hamish this evening and it's great to be back with you. Joining me on the panel tonight, Ruta, a writer, youth actor, advocate and law student Yasmin Poole, Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Paul Fletcher. Joining us from Brisbane, singer-songwriter Katie Noonan. You'll hear a lovely song from her a bit later on. Shadow Minister for the NDIS and former Labor leader Bill Shorten and President of Chief Executive Women, Sue Morford. Please welcome our panel. Remember, you can stream us on iview, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag and we'd love to hear from you on social media. Let's get to our first question tonight. It comes from the studio. It comes from Gary Mann. Uh, good evening, panel. Thank you for being here. Uh, now, Australia is in quite an enviable position compared to a lot of countries in the world with our coronavirus response. However, lately there's been some general unrest in the community and that seems to have led to some small pocket outbreaks in Victoria as well as uh, a bit of reduced uptake of the COVID Safe app. Now, in your opinion, um, how should we not only educate but look to motivate uh, some of these marginalised communities to take proactive steps towards their health? Thanks, Gary. Bill Shorten, I wish you going to start with you because I think a lot of these, or some of these hotspots, are actually in your electorate. Yeah, they are. Thanks for your question, Gary. Um, obviously, in the last few days, we've seen an upward track in Victoria a number of people saying they have the virus or been tested positive. And I contacted some of my friends who are working in the front line of the health response to ask them, is this the second wave? And what's causing this? Um, and what these health professionals said to me as recently as this evening is they said it's a phenomena of community transmission. They think it's also a phenomena of family gatherings. Uh, and they're particularly seeing perhaps more young people testing positive, which means that whilst they're capable of withstanding this virus more often than not, there is real risk that could spread to older people. What's so particular about your part of Melbourne, though, that it seems to be located just there in the north and west? Well, um, what we see is we've got a, quite a multicultural community. Uh, I think that what we're seeing is family gatherings are the, um, the particular sort of transmission spot. I, I was, had someone else reach out to me today and say in the high Public Housing Commission, the high-rise flats in Flemington, we need to get more material in more languages so people can understand what they need to do so that there's less panic and confusion. Has that been a bit of a miss in, in your estimation, Minister? I, I noticed today that the Mayor of Stonington here in Victoria uh, said that a number of the mayors had made a direct plea to the federal government to try and get material in different languages, not the state government. Maybe we should point out that the Mayor of Stonington is not of the same political stripe as the, um, as the state Premier, and maybe it was a political play, but, but a direct appeal to try and get la uh, information in different languages. Has the state government missed that? Well, what we need to do, obviously, is provide the public health advice that reflects the nature of modern Australia. We're an extremely diverse multicultural nation. Now, uh, SBS in my portfolio has been doing a lot of work with the Federal Department of Health and State and Territory Health Departments in translating material into over 60 languages. So there is a significant focus on getting those health messages uh, into all of the relevant languages used in our community. Uh, this is a continuing effort. Uh, we all need to uh, remember that the threat has not gone away. Gone away. COVID-19 is among us. We all need to maintain those basic practices of the social mm. distancing, the cough etiquette. Uh, download the app, please. If you haven't downloaded the app, it's getting on for six and a half million Australians have downloaded, downloaded the app. And, and yet it, has, it hasn't picked up a single case that hasn't been already 
uh, picked up by manual contact tracing. So I think that was your reference to the to the app there, wasn't it, Gary? That it's not not delivered on its promise. Well, that's not actually right. Um, there are instances where it has has. There's at least one case where it's picked up uh, a case of somebody uh, who would not have been picked up by one methods. case for, for six but, million but, downloads. But can I make the point? Well. We want to do everything we can. We want to take every step to maximise the safety of Australians. Can I sure, make but the you point might have expected the, a bit more, Mike. One of the other things that it's done is it allows contact tracing to occur more quickly because it's designed to supplement the work of our state and territory health officials who do the physical contact tracing. Uh, bear in mind also that a lot of our cases recently have been people coming into Australia from overseas and quarantining in hotels who may not yet have downloaded the app, but it's a very important tool. We're now on uh, release 7, so we're continuing to upgrade it. Uh, over 90%, well over 90% of smartphones now are able to use it. Sure. It's, it's part of the uh, the tool set. L let me go back to the question. Of, I think you're a hospital worker, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see any value in the app? I'd, I'd rather not comment on that. Um, <laughs> I, I see the value in the app. Um, if it catches the right people mm. um, and if it uh, motivates people to be proactive about their health. Um, I'm very happy with the educational approach that we've had so far and getting it into many languages. Um, but uh, for me, we need to also motivate people to take positive uh, steps for their health. And the positive steps is the really difficult thing when you see complacency creep in. Sue so Morford, can I come to you, particularly from a business perspective? You must be like the rest of the, the country and community watching this and thinking, when do we ever get out of this, this new hell? What's your response to it all? We need it to... We, we need to keep it tight, as tight as we can, because uh, we know that businesses are going to be very, very steadily coming back, and we know that unemployment is going to grow if we rush back in. So we've got to manage the pace between being pleased and opening up and being cautious mm. and managing. It's a big deal. I think we need to be looking to see what are the safety nets? Are we looking after our frontline workers? Can we keep them in work? Can we manage them with childcare? Have we got enough support in our community so that frontliners can work, so that people can go back but we also need to make sure that the JobKeeper job keeper is not um, just cut off at the end of September. We'll, we'll we've got a question on that, that so we'll get Absolutely. to that a bit later on. Absolutely. But just before I move on to the next that. question, Sue Morford, uh, is the pace about right, in your view, at the moment? Of opening? Mm. Yes, it is, because I think all businesses are being cautious and all sectors of the industry, of industry are being cautious. Okay. What we have to hope is that our population is being as cautious. Okay. Can I also mention we're talking about frontline workers. I mean, my mum's a nurse and it's been really actually stressful seeing her have to go to work and, and battle through this crisis every day. And there was even a COVID-19 scare in her workplace a few weeks ago and thankfully she was fine. But when we have this, this discussion about the second wave, of course people might be impacted, but frontline workers haven't really received a pay rise. I mean, my mother, you know, I come from a low-income background and we're still struggling and I haven't mm -hmm. seen any difference there. So I think that's also a really important conversation and how we value and treat our frontline healthcare workers as well. Yeah, it's a good point. Let's uh, go to our next question. It's a video question from Leah Barclay, an Indigenous sound artist and composer who works at the University of the Sunshine <laughs> Coast in Queensland. Good evening. This is a question for Minister Paul Fletcher. I'm wondering why does the government need to set up a ministerial task force to implement its new $250 million investment in the arts sector? Surely as the government's arts funding and advisory body, this is absolutely core business for the Australia Council for the Arts. Without the independence, peer assessment, transparency and oversight that the Australia Council can and always does provide, this new fund runs a very real risk of becoming like many other funding disasters we've seen recently. And given the very limited funds on offer, how will this new task force pick winners and losers without opening the government up to claims of bias? Well, Leah Barclay there. I'm, I'll, Minister, I'll come to you um, in a minute, but Katie Noonan, I'd like to go straight to you on this. Your response to, to how the system's been set up. Yeah, well, I would have to agree with um, Professor Barclay uh, from Gabi Gabi Country, which is actually where I live. Um, I, I think a lot of people have concerns about the creative 
Economy Task Force because this package, as wonderful as it is, and there are a lot of awesome things to celebrate, um, I would be concerned that people would feel that the decision-making process was, you know, politicised and it should be done by a bipartisan, completely independent um, body, which, of course, is the Australia Council for the Arts and has been for over 50 years. So I think that seems... You know, we trust Austra the Australia Council and um, so are I think Are you that saying you don't trust better. the government? Um, well, I think <laughs> I'm saying that it needs to be a bipartisan, non-political process. Mm. And um, at the moment, if that Creative Economy Task Force is obviously being put together by one government and with, without another, um, that probably isn't the best way to judge the, uh, the grants that we have on offer. Paul Fletcher, what's your response to that? Oh, well, thank you, Leah, for the question. So our $250 million package is designed to restart activity in the arts sector. Uh, $75 million of grants, $90 million of concessional loans, uh, $35 million for systemically important uh, arts companies to sustain them, um, and $50 million for film and television. Now, of course, we'll be drawing on the advice of the Australia Council. Uh, I'll be drawing on the advice of my department and... Uh, will be drawing the advice of this Creative Economy Task Force. This is $250 million to spend over one year. That is a significant amount of money. We want to get as many views as possible. We want to make sure we're getting the views uh, not just of the subsidised part of the sector, but of businesses which have historically been purely commercial but may need that support. The challenge is that over this period where venues have been closed, artists have lost their gigs, performance has been cancelled, the people, the businesses, the organisations uh, that normally put on productions, events, shows, festivals, that takes capital. It costs money to hire yes. a venue, hire a crew, hire a cast, market the show. Um, I, just want, I just want to take you to the nut of the question, mm. which is about the, the model you've set up to distribute this money and the very real apprehension that our questioner has, that it won't be independent. It's clearly not business as usual arm's length. That's the business of OSCO, the Australia Council. And as uh, uh, Leah said, they know how to do this. Uh, the concern is that the only assumption you can draw is if you're not going to put in place that arm's length process, that the government wants some control of the outcome. Is that a fair assumption? Well, what we'll be doing, of course, is establishing guidelines and making assessments against those guidelines. We'll go through a proper grant process and we will be drawing on this through this Creative Economy Task Force on a diversity of views in advising the government. What we want to do is make sure we get as many perspectives as possible, different parts of the country, different parts of the sector, subsidised, non-subsidised, so that we can allocate this money as effectively as possible to get production so shows, that, that, events happening. They'll all get a say on the grants process. The, the, the we'll be taking advice widely on how we allocate this funding and the decisions we've made to date with the package have been based on very wide consultation. Okay. Like, get... Will you also be engaging with young people in the arts in that process? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, young people are a critical part of the arts sector uh, and we want to make sure... I mean, what we, what we don't want to do... Um, is simply look at one part of the sector which is very well represented, has a strong voice at the table through the Australia Council and risk missing other parts of the sector which might well include uh, the smaller companies, the younger artists, those who are not perhaps plugged into those uh, existing networks. That's one of the precise reasons why we want to make sure we're getting our advice as widely as possible. Let me hear from Bill Shorten on this one. Sports rorts. Uh, this government, when they politicise the allocation of money, have demonstrated they can't be trusted. Now, that doesn't take anything away from the package, and it's good that a package has been announced. You could argue it should have been 100 days earlier, yeah. but they've announced something, so that is good. But why on earth are they going to Leah's question? You've got the Australia Council to avoid the politicisation of arts funding. A previous arts minister, George Brandis, before he got promoted to London... He took $100 million off the arts, uh, off the Australia Council and allocated himself. That ended in tears. And let's be very clear, that's not what we're well, doing. There is no change to existing Australia Council funding. But the Australia Council has a very big no, job no, no. and it's going to keep doing it. Paul, you're, you're a smart fellow, but you know that wasn't the point I was making. The point I was making is not the amount of money which the Australia Council has. Why have a uh, political process... I mean, you've got to admit in sports rorts you didn't cover yourselves in glory. This virus and the effects are too important for politics as usual crap. So why don't we just let the, uh, the official body 
do it. And if you think that they're missing points, raise it with them. Let, let me see if Katie Noonan thinks that would be an effective way to go, do you? Sorry, what was an that, effective, An effective way to go to actually put it back into the, into the, the ballywick of, of the Australia Council and let them decide. Oh, no, I think... I think this is excellent that this is a separate package and it's a really important investment into the economic and social recovery of our country because the arts is such a wonderful portal through which to do that. But, yes, I would have to say that there have been um, a lot of concerns that this will become a politicised process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd like to remind um, uh, the ministers there this evening that the Australia Council for the Arts was actually set up in a Liberal government in the 60s and it's been a truly bipartisan independent until Brandis, but other than the Catalyst disaster, it has been a truly independent think tank that has um, has their, you know, their fingers on the pulse of the arts across the whole country, not just the MPAs. You know, they fund everyone from country rock, the major pop, performing jazz. Arts and look, let's be clear, the Australia yeah. Council has a very important role. It will continue to have a very important role. It will continue to have very substantial funding to allocate under its existing programs and it will be a major source of advice to government as we go through the implementation of these programs. But right. why invent a new bureaucracy? Yeah. Uh, because what we want to do is make sure we are getting the widest possible mm. sources of advice. This is a unique challenge. We want to yeah. stimulate a whole sector restarting, which has basically had to suspend almost all activity. The arts and entertainment sector oh. has been hit very hard, and so we want to make sure we're getting the widest possible sources of advice so we can deploy this $250 million in 12 months, a substantial amount of money. We've got to get it working as effectively as we can. The money's good, yeah. but I've just got to keep saying there's not a big vote of confidence in the Australia Council. Anyway, I yep. think we've all made our respective points. All right, let's move on to our next question tonight. It's a video question. It comes from cinematographer Gerald Wiblin from Coburg in Victoria. The film and television industry was one of the hardest hit, with production ceasing almost immediately as the pandemic hit. Many of those productions have not come back and they don't know when they're going to start again. Due to the way our employment contracts are set up, many people do not qualify for JobKeeper and there's no way that we can work from home either. My question for you, Paul, is why have you turned your back on the $117 billion industry that you represent and why haven't you fought harder for us? The $250 million stimulus package announced in the last week is just a drop in the ocean and really isn't going far enough for the people that you represent. Well, thanks, Gerald. And look, there's no doubt that this has been devastating for people in the arts and entertainment sector, the screen sector. One of the elements of last week's package that is so important is that 50 million temporary interruption fund for film and television productions, because there's a specific problem in film and television. I've consulted quite extensively with uh, producers. The challenge is putting together their financing packages at the moment because they can't get insurance against a COVID-19 risk that a key mm. cast member or director, for example, might suddenly fall ill and the production um, can't, can't proceed. This temporary interruption fund is designed to uh, solve that problem so we can get screen and television productions happening again. It, co it uh, reinforces the work that's been done by the Australian Film and Television Radio School working with people across the industry to develop COVID-safe uh, operating protocols so that it's safe uh, to go on set and get those films and TV productions happening. So what we're focused on with the package is getting activity restarted in relation to people in the arts and entertainment sector and JobKeeper and job seeker, We've got a range of arrangements to support people. I would make the point... Let's, let's, let's not rehearse through those, though, because we know what they are. I want to take you back to the, the nub of the question, though, which gets to the quantum. Mm. And I, I guess the real question to be asked here is, why have you capped this industry and not not another. Why is this the industry to cap with the amount of money that you'll allow to get this industry back on its feet, whereas with Job Builder, there's no cap? Well, look, let's be just, very just, clear. Just tell me, just tell me why that, that, the difference. Virginia, let's be very clear. That's a Greens talking point. That was an observation that the Greens made. I don't really but, care if it's but, a Greens talking point. But, it's my question. But the fact is that you the, can great, answer my question, the great majority Fletcher. of government programs 
uh, are for a specific amount to do a specific thing. There's nothing well, at all unusual. Why, but why cap, why cap this one? Because what we know about the arts, about a, apart from it being the um, the first out and the absolute last back in, whenever that might be in whatever whatever form, it's a multiplier. And it's also the driver sure. of so many other key parts of the economy, whether it be education or whether it be hospitality and the like. So, again, just tell me the thinking about why that one's capped. Well, there is nothing at all unusual about allocating a defined sum of money... But tell me the thinking a, behind a, it. Well, the thinking was, let's come up with a substantial amount of money that is going to restart activity in the arts sector. Uh, so, for example, normally the annual funding to the Australia Council is a bit over $200 million a year. This is a one-time injection of a further $250 million. This is going to make a significant difference in getting Can I production... Just, yeah, um, no, jump in there, Katie, yeah. Well, if I could jump in, it's actually not $250 million, it's 160. million. So we yeah. just need to remember that 90 of them are concessional loans. So calling it 250 mm. is a little um, uh, not quite right. Well, if I can but just I be clear... If I can just be clear on that point, so the, 90, the, the reason we've included loans is because Live Performance Australia, which represents many arts companies, performers, produce, uh, uh, promoters, uh, proposed that there should be significant loans as part of the package. So we think this will assist promoters, okay. arts companies and I so want, on. I want to, to let Katie, Katie mm. finish there. Well, I think actually part of what the questioner was saying is, you know, um, according to the uh, new approach done last year, you know, the Australian recreation industry employs 600,000 people. And the fine print of the package on Friday said that the JobKeeper package currently supports this sector to the tune of about $100 million per month via JobKeeper and the cash flow stimulus. Um, but the problem is with that, when you do some basic maths, um, and as we discussed, it's actually only supporting 25,000 arts artists and arts workers. So that leaves 575,000 that are currently left out of the JobKeeper package. And, you know, on the 8th of April, when our Arts Minister voted no to amendments to allow casuals, freelance artists and all those spectacular humans who... Uh, have dedicated their life to this sector and fall through the cracks. They are now on Job Seeker, which is not only less money, but also they've effectively been told, you don't have a real job. Well, just and a couple I think of things that's there. Part so, of the the, so um, that the first of all, that amendment you're talking about. Let, let's be clear. That was a second reading amendment moved by the Labor Party in the House of Representatives. Yeah. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to let Bill shorten. No, no, but the point's in. important. The government, the po stop talking about us. The point is important. If that okay. amendment had been passed, knock yourself out. The whole bill, the whole stimulus program, JobKeeper would not have proceeded. Oh, now Labor said they supported JobKeeper, <laughs> and yet they moved this amendment, which was, oh. um, you know, it was for, it was politics. Okay. They'd never expected or wanted it to pass I don't, because I don't, they knew. I don't want to get lost down that rabbit hole. If of that politics. happened, well, but that even the if, job if we move on from that point, yeah, fact, Ka Ka the Katie and then, and then Bill Shorten, yeah, yeah. Katie. I was just going to say, let's even, happy to move on from that point, but the fact is only 25,000 arts workers and artists yeah. are receiving JobKeeper well, can, and, the, and the statistics are there are 600,000. Can I just so clarify something? No, no, I'm, I'm going to go to Bill Shorten, then I'll go, then I'll go back to you, Minister, and Thank I want to hear from uh, the rest of the panel too. Bill Shorten? Uh, going back to the question which the uh, filmmaker... Jared. Jared made, was this. I think that, again, it's good that they're doing something, so I'm not going to totally rubbish that. But the issue with JobKeeper is that it only goes for permanent employees. Yeah. So the point that's being made is if you're a makeup artist, a contractor, a freelance artist, uh, a casual, and the nature of this industry, like many industries, is you don't have permanent employment. So in the good times, we rely on this deregulated employment market to deliver services. But in the bad time, they can't get JobKeeper. And I saw, I think, two simple improvements to make to the package, Paul. One make it accessible for casuals and a whole lot of people who work in this industry every day. We can't just wish them away when it's difficult and ignore what happens. The other thing is, are we really going to just stop everything on September the 25th? Because if we do, we're going to fall off a cliff. I know the government's yep. got a report about the future yep. of JobKeeper, but you've got a by-election this Saturday and you're not releasing the report till after the by-election. I mean, that does sound political. Uh, well, we, what we're doing is we are considering carefully uh, that report, that work oh. on what the future of JobKeeper is. The Treasurer has made it very clear. 
we, we've got a review underway. There's an economic statement coming in late July. Okay. That's and when we will we'll announce come, we'll come what to that a bit, we a bit do later there. in our conversation as well. Sue Morford, from a, your perspective, I guess you can see the multiplier effect that I was speaking of earlier when it comes to the performing arts and the entertainment and the arts sector. Uh, has, has the government acted as it should in order to support that when the floor fell out? I think it's, been, it's far too late. Uh, because the people that are in this sector have had significantly reduced incomes and not able to tap into to JobKeeper, as we're saying. The second thing is we know that it supports so many businesses outside um, and it's internationally competitive, our arts sector, mm. so we should be doing everything we can to keep it viable. We could be doing everything we can to keep the um, participants in that sector viable so that then, in turn, they are prepared and ready to go back. One of the things about the people who work in the arts is that they know that they're never going to have... Many of them know that they're never going to have um, great full-time work and so, therefore, they rely on other industries to prop up their income, such as hospitality, um, accommodation and the likes. And so that's also decimated. So this is a real wipeout for a sector and for it's... many, many people who are working in it. Yasmin? I mean, I would also touch upon when we're talking about necessary reforms, the JobKeeper payment actually in inherently discriminates against young people, especially mm. through casual work, and also the fact that young people in the arts and young people more broadly are still subject to... They're still uh, viewed as dependent and, and under mm. the age of 22, which means that young people that aren't relying on their parents' income may still be ineligible for JobKeeper and suffer as a result. Mm. And secondly, I'd also... Um, when we talk about the multiplier effect of the arts industry, it's also important to consider that we can't just view the arts industry in a silo. Um, you know, I was thinking about it and we've all been young once, right? And music and the arts is so absolutely huge. One of the huge in this world. Yes. It's true. <laughs> but absolutely important to, to, to the experience of being mm. young. You know, music and the arts validates, you know, your soul, your emotions, your feelings. Yeah. So to, to, I guess, to silence the arts industry, in a sense, also silences young people. So it's vitally important that we can't let this industry go dark. Can I say, I'm, I'm in heated agreement very, with very Jasmine and with, and with Sue. Uh, one of the reasons we're supporting the arts sector in this way is because when you go and see a show, you very often go to a bar and have a drink, you go to a restaurant and have a meal, you might stay overnight in a hotel because you've travelled there. The multiplier effects are significant. Yes, Economic saying, activity yes. in the arts is important, as well as all the intrinsic reasons why the arts is so important. Can I put in a plea to save Channel 31 and Channel 44 then? Yeah, community radio. Just putting it out there. I, I will, I will, do a deal here. I will say that I received a number of a number of questions on that. We have to move on to our next question. But do you want to very quickly say that you're going to save Channel 31? Yes or no? Uh, I can announce tonight that we will be extending Channel One, uh, Channel 31, and Channel 44 for another 12 months. I've got a few uh, other asks as well. So we're on yeah. roll. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing you're going to get out of this. But um, we'll have more for to 12, say for, for 12 for months only. For 12 months. Oh. Let, let's be clear. It's been our policy since 2014 that these community television stations should move to operating in a digital mode uh, and uh, both Channel 31 in uh, Melbourne, Channel 44 in Adelaide have several times said yes they're going to make that transition. They have been extended several times. I've agreed now and we'll be announcing it formally tomorrow to extend for a well, further 12 months just for both, both of those channels but we will be using this period to work through with them what needs to happen for them to successfully transition to digital operations so that we can still have community TV is a great place where people can work, can make programs, be responsive to the community and then disseminate using so, digital... So you will, uh, at the end of 12 months, or due, during those 12 months, you will assist them materially, financially, if you have to, in order to... Um, this is a question. In order to get them to the digital platform they need to be on and, therefore, you can take we the spectrum away. We want to work away. with them to assist... Uh, work with them on that transition. Money? Uh, let's... We're, we're not at that point yet. But we probably we, money. But what we want to do is work with Channel 31 and Channel 44 in Melbourne and Adelaide. Uh, we think the best way for them to operate is in a digital mode. That's been the government's okay. policy since 2014. Uh, we're going to spend the next oh. 12 months on that. That's so one, they, they that's will one win for Q&A. They will extend. We get more. We should get more government ministers. There's, on there's going to be quite a few people claiming credit for that tomorrow, Bill. But, <laughs> you know, well done. Um, that's that's what I'm happy to share with. Uh, that, the rest well, of us. that is that is indeed good news. Thank you. Um, let's go to our next question. It's a video question now from Matilda Drage, who's from La in Victoria. Minister, 
Fletcher. Why have the people that work for ABC Me in Melbourne lost their jobs? My favourite presenter is Pip and she has lost her job. Minister Fletcher, have you actually watched ABC Me? It is really good and they should get the money they need. Thank you. Well, you're in such a generous mood tonight, um, Minister. Maybe you want to reinstate some ABC funding if you're well, announcing uh, channels can continue. Go on. Matilda, there's a thing called operational uh, editorial and financial independence of ABC board and management. Oh. And so, look, the facts are um, the ABC has secure funding. We're in the first year of a three-year period. ABC funding increasing every year over that period. Uh, the ABC has been aware of its funding uh, since the current Trinium funding arrangements were announced in 2018. Board and management uh, then are charged with making decisions in relation to how they uh, allocate that funding. Uh, some announcements were made last week in the context of the ABC releasing its five-year strategic plan. Um, so that's the basis of the decision. They're not decisions made by a minister. No, but the decision's made because of a cut. And, well, um, it's not it, a cut. Well... Oh. It's not a cut. I, I, don't, I, don't know how much, I don't know how much more time it's not a cut. I, I want to ABC give on the ABC to this backwards and forwards up. about it. Well, well you know, Minister, I've had this discussion Minister, with several Minister, ABC journalists. The funding journalists simply sort of... has not gone up over the period. In fact, it's going down. That's not true. Virginia, Virginia I brought the budget paper true. because I've seen Paul give other mm. interviews on this. It's simply not true. A little bit of homework never hurt. Mm. This is the budget paper, page 72 from the 2018 budget. The highlighted bit, I don't know if the camera can make it, but it says it's cuts... A reduction, it says, this is a reduction in spending on the ABC by $83.7 million over the next three years. Like, if you don't believe Ida Buttrose and you don't believe the National Party leader in New South Wales, this is in the budget paper. It's you know, a cut. I also you know, Bill, it's, 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 cut. it's quite interesting because... Um, uh, yes, but I, do, I in, do want to hear from Yasmin here rather than... In, in 2018, you were, arguing, you were arguing that the government had cut $1.8 billion from aged care funding. ABC, we, uh, ABC Minister, fact Minister, check. Wow. This is highly relevant because ABC... Minister, Minister, let's stay on that subject or we're, we're not hearing from that at all. Th this yeah. is the subject of ABC funding because ABC fact check deems that an adjustment to future spending does not represent a cut when the overall level of spending continues yeah, to rise. That's ABC fact check in uh, October 2018. That's exactly the situation that oh. we're in. So in 2018, the government took a decision in relation to triennial funding for the ABC. Um, that did not include indexation, uh, ah. but it did mean an increase in ABC funding every year uh, this is the argument that the oh, ABC... Oh, I, 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 we've, we've been over this again. I have got the figures in front of me, which I'm happy to rehearse, but I want to hear from Yasmin first. Well, I was going to say, I mean, first, it's very questionable that you say that there's not cuts, but it's even more it's questionable true. that under your government you've commissioned a $200,000 report to look into the effects of public broadcasters versus, versus commercial rivals. And to be honest, with that $200,000 report, mm. I'd like to question, is that the best use of taxpayer money? And secondly, I suspect that that report will just be used to justify further cuts to the ABC. Mm. And speaking of... As a young person, can I just emphasise, I mean, even in the ABC Charter, its focus is on reflecting the cultural diversity of Australia. And as a 21-year-old, it's incredibly rare and pretty unheard of that I'd be given a platform on any other media outlet. Yeah. And even mm. if we look at things like the Black Lives Matter movement in Australia, I would switch on the TV and be so frustrated seeing a lack of Indigenous, Indigenous Australian representation on other platforms. So to cut the ABC, especially now, I mean, after the bushfires, after COVID-19 and its general importance in Australia, I think is, is truly a tragedy. Well, you could look at That's NITV right. on SBS, for example, the other national broadcaster. But why cut the ABC in the first place? We're not cutting the ABC. ABC oh. funding is going up. Oh. In, oh, oh, these I'm are actually, the facts, actually, ladies for and the, For the record, the I'm, go, I'm going to read through these figures in a moment, but Sue Morfitt, it appears do you reckon you know what, what a cut looks like in a budget? I surely do. <laughs> I surely do, and I wish I didn't. Um, the reality, though, my understanding is that the promised amounts weren't delivered and the promised amounts were cut. Well, so that's so not true either, actually. So if wow. you're running... A, but if you're running a business, you have to plan in advance for the amount of money that's coming through. And if there's a discrepancy on that, it needs to be resolved so that you can run your business appropriately. It appears that the ABC is not able to do that. The whole problem with, the, with this is the ABC has got one source of revenue, the government. Many other businesses can go and find other sources of mm. revenue. Plus the fact that ABC is going through structural change, so therefore it has to find funds for structural change as well as running. The point to make, though, I think, is that, back to what Desmond says, is that this institution is so powerfully um, loved and trusted 
by the Australian community. It is needed by the Australian community in the country where media is falling yeah. off and it is mm. vital that we get news where we need it, we get service where we need it and we get culture where we need it that will not come where commercial interests have to take heart. And so we yeah. strongly back the ABC. That's why it's mm. funded with over a billion dollars a year, going up every year. Just last year, in the last budget, we committed an extra $43.7 million for additional regional and local news gathering for the ABC. So the ABC has secure and rising funding. No other media business has, uh, has the certainty of revenue that the ABC has. In fact, just about every other media business has seen a catastrophic drop in revenue this year due to a loss of that, that, But the rest of the month, the ABC, like you were saying that they're all equal, I beg your yeah. pardon, Sue. No, no, no. Um, the reality is that in England, they put $8.6 billion into the BBC. We put $1.1 billion. We're a third of their population, but we only fund our public broadcaster one-eighth. 18 other comparable countries fund public broadcasting more. And you keep comparing them to Fairfax 9 or News Limited, they're profit-making entities. They don't have the obligations the ABC has. I mean, this is one of the issues in that Eden Monero by-election, but in the bushfires, no-one else is rushing no. to do that job. In the Pacific, no-one else is rushing to do that job. We're making a long-term uh, mistake in our national interest, our national conversation. Media concentration is getting greater. The ABC is special. Of course the ABC is special. That is why we provide uh, substantial and growing funding for the ABC. And, of course, the ABC has done a good job in relation to the bushfires, as have commercial media. Uh, it's done a good job in relation to COVID-19, as has commercial media. That's why it's got secure and rising funding. But we also need to recognise... Minister, that regional media is under pressure. That's why we've committed $50 million in our public interest news yes. gathering program for regional broadcasters and regional newspapers. And as a result of that, there will be newspapers reopening in country towns. Minister, I'm, 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 I'm going to move on. I've got the figures here, though. Um, you're ignoring the fact in what you're saying and talking about that 2019-2020 that, uh, uh, budget. In the first year of the three-year period... The funding fell from 1097 million to 1084 million for the total budget and from 916 million to 900 million for the general operational activities budget. And even with the continued increase in transmission and distribution, and I think that's where we get cute about the funding rising, the total budget will still not recover to the 2018 19 level. As far off as 22 23, the operational budget barely moves from 29 20 and remains lower than 2018 19 for four. Well, Yes, Virginia, that's what that, I call a that cut. Is, that is not true. The well, funding, the, figure, the, funding figures, the figures are taken from the budget and we can't waste any more time on this. I'm going to go to our next question. And it's higher than You've when we came to government. You've made the point several times, Minister. Our next question now comes from Marg Darcy. Um, thanks, Virginia. Um, I'm concerned that the actions that this government has taken seem to indicate that they're more concerned about jobs for boys than they are for women. They've stopped JobKeeper for childcare workers before anyone else, a workforce made up mostly of women. They have allocated uncapped funds for construction workers, even though that is an industry that did not have to close down during the lockdown and that employs mostly men. Much research has shown that women are the worst affected by the economic impact of the pandemic. Why is it then that your government appears to favour jobs for men in the recovery? I'm not going to go to you first, Minister. I'm going to go to Sue Morford and then to Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. And thank you, Marg, very much for that question. You're absolutely right. Uh, the women... It is well known that women will be and have been worst affected by this pandemic in their jobs and also that we know they're going to come out of this crisis worse. Uh, many women hold part-time jobs and hold casual jobs. As a matter of fact, women hold the greatest percentage of part-time jobs in Australia. And they are the ones that have been slipping through. So we know that women are highly skilled, highly capable, and will really help the return to normality for our economy and for our community. But we need some things. One, we've got to have stimulus into the sectors that employ the majority of women. That goes without saying. We know we have stimulus elsewhere, but construction is 90% men. And we've got all these women over here who do not have the same superannuation levels, do not have the same take-home pay and have the burden of childcare. So we need stimulus in their sectors and we need childcare. 
so that all women, irrespective of what they do, can take on any job they are offered, any shift that they're offered, any extra hours or extra days, without childcare being the burden that it is for many, many households to work beyond part-time. And the women are so capable and the sectors are not well rewarded and they should be. Yasmin? Well, I mean, we've, we've long known that women, women's um, productivity in the workforce enhances, you know, economic activity. But you know what? I think this really reflects. I think this reflects the fact that the COVID-19 response is led by men, Scott Morrison, Greg Hunt, Brendan Murphy. It reflects the fact that the COVID-19 Coordination Commission only has two women and six men and no gender experts. Absolute shame. Um, all that COVID-19 has done is revealed the existing flaws within the current economic system. Yes. The fact that women have a disproportionately high burden of care performing almost double that amount of time at home, the pay gap, the fact that we have an ongoing masculine idea of leadership. And I actually don't think it's enough to simply say we need more women to enhance the economy. The actual economic structure is inherently unfair. We need more female leaders in this response to ask necessary feminist questions. OK, mm -hmm. Noonan. Well, um, obviously, um, I'm a fiercely proud uh, female artist, but actually, coming back to some positive news, I mean, the art sector is actually one of the... one of the sectors that does represent gender parity. It's approximately 50% male and 50% women. So the package that Minister Fletcher did announce on Friday is a truly uh, good package for all of Australia. But um, as you said, the, the uh, construction sector's 13% female, mining's 9%. And I must admit, the consultation process into this arts package seemed to be... I'm not sure if any women were involved um, at all. Well, certainly no, none have come out publicly. Uh, and the two artists involved in the process were both uh, male as well. So um, I'm just trying to put a positive spin on things, at least this package is going out to a, to a workforce that's equal. Minister, do, do you take the point that there's a, a systemic problem, as Sue Morfitt has pointed out, when you pull away that financial support from the childcare sector, that then immediately that disadvantages a massive part of the workforce that often finds it to get in in the first place? Finds it hard, I mean. I think we do know that this recession, which has hit us very quickly and very sharply, uh, the evidence suggests it's hitting women harder than men. Can you it's, address it's, some, of, some of Sue's so suggestions it's, directly? It's, what do you think might it's be It's different used? to, say, the 1990 recession, which was typically affecting blue-collar men. Now we've got a recession which seems to be affecting women more. Um, so what's like the answer? Lot, well, like a lot of things in economics, we'll only really know, I guess, with hindsight, exactly how uh, the impact has felt. But well, that, we can't wait till then, though, that, can we? That appears to be the indication right now. Well, Minister we, Fletcher, we, I mean, it just goes to show that, you, to be honest, you don't have enough women in your party. But I can give you some tips. Um, the first thing I need, I think we need, is a gender disaggregated data around COVID-19 to understand how it's disproportionately yeah, affecting women. We then need a gender-responsive budget in order to compensate that unfair economic structure. And when we talk about the economic impact of COVID-19, we also have to talk about the unpaid work economy and the informal work economy which women are disproportionately make up. Sue Morford. And we have to look at the women who are capable of lifting our productivity that are staying at home because they can't afford to leave home and do the extra work. So there's that. So, is, so just to jump in, is funded, one simple fix, is funded childcare the answer to that problem? Absolutely it is. It. Well funded and very, very sl to slowly drop off over the slowly week. Slowly so taper women off. Taper off so that women can work a full week. That's number one. Is but that an second... impossibility, Minister? Uh, well, my colleague Dan Tien, the uh, Education Minister, has worked very hard to, first of all, uh, respond extremely quickly when we saw... But, it's, but uh, we're, talking, we're talking about what's not what's well, been taken we, we away. Well, we saw a number of childcare uh, uh, centres uh, facing an existential threat. So we moved very quickly. Of course, what we've now done is moved to transition away from that uh, because we were also getting mm -hmm. feedback from the sector about... Um, uh, the temporary arrangements we put in and some concerns about their it needs, it needs a full review. Before the October budget, it needs a full review so that we're in a position to capitalise on what we can going forward so that we can, we can build our economy the best possible way and we need women's help to do it. I think also that there's been many other areas of our... Um, other sectors within our economy that have um, been particularly decimated throughout this period and they are predominantly 
um, employ women, such as hospitality and accommodation and um, retail and uh, small businesses uh, and food production, etc. And we need to have a look at the resources that we're putting back into those sectors so that they can quickly employ, because part-timers are going to be the last ones to be employed, mm. and these particular sectors do employ part And also the women. fact that women within that are not uh, often disproportionately don't receive job keeper because of being casuals. I'm just going to move on to our next yeah. question. It comes, uh, it's in the studio and it comes from Joseph Zeleznikov. <laughs> Apologies for mangling your name, Joseph. It's all right, it happens a lot. Uh, hi, <laughs> uh, hi, panel, thanks for having me here. I first want to stress that my question is general um, mm -hmm. and it's to, it's to everyone, mainly the two um, MPs on the panel. Hmm. How often does stacking happen in Australian <laughs> politics? And how can anyone have faith in our political system with the amount of corruption that goes on? How, how uh, often does branch stacking happen in Australian politics? I'll, I'll take that one <laughs> all the time. But um, who should we start with? Well, Bill Shorten, uh, your party mm, has guess been... guess I'd start. Um, yeah, under, under big pressure there. And look, it's, it, it's not... So, no, no, that's all right. It's not surprising. It's gone on in your party for well, a very long time well, on First of all, right. and I'll go to Joseph's question, most people who get involved in politics, I know more about the Labor Party and the others might know more about other organisations, do it for the right reasons. What we saw recently was some footage of things done for all the wrong reasons and things which were done out of the gaze of most people. So we do have to have a full clean up, but yet this has been done before, so it is frustrating that it's happened again. Well, I think that's why the, the phrase a full clean up probably rings a bit hollow because... Oh, I understand that reaction. But no, Bill Shorten, it, it has happened not only so often that, that the, the names of those people who are the powerful figures on either the left or the right in the Labor Party are household names. You know, we know that the power brokers who do this and who... Either, either stack illegally or just get a whole lot of people signed up in order to bump someone out of their seat. What do you actually do to fix it? Well, Malcolm Turnbull released his biography recently where he boasted about We'll get about to the it. Liberal Party in a moment. Let's no, no, but that happens up. to be a book on the public yeah, yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. Not that I bought it, I'll but I read to, the excerpt. I'll get to that. I'll get um, to that. Sorry, Malcolm. Um, <laughs> in all fairness, I think that for the vast majority of people in political parties, this is as frustrating and as hair-pulling out as it is for everyone else. But, no. but the moment you hear of it, you do something about it. What I find hard to believe is that mm. the particular story we're talking about in Victoria, uh, the, the person involved there was reported in the paper, well, on a casual count, at least 10 news reports I would have read that I imagine the Premier would have read as well. And yet it comes as a dreadful shock and surprise that we find something yeah. bad's going on in the branch. Come on. I understand the scepticism. But what I don't think that fairly describes is the motivation of most people in politics. There will always be people who try and break the rules. And it's hard to think of any set of rules where someone won't try and get sure, around but them. Sure, but what I'm talking about is what you do the moment you get a whiff of that. And well, it just seems that I in this case think one thing there wasn't which much we can done. Do, I think one thing which we can do is set up a national anti-corruption commission. Because there's such disillusion with politics and this adds to it, that I think politicians uh, and other people in public life have to accept that they're going to get scrutinised and that's why I think a National Anti-Corruption Commission would be a down payment because people have heard parties make promises before. Mm. You need to see real change. And whilst I think that Steve Brax and Jenny Macklin will engage in real change to their very best abilities, I actually think we need to change the way we do our politics in this country full stop so that shortcuts aren't the reason. I got into politics to help workers, you know, help set up the NDIS... We've had a bit of a win recently on robo-debt and we keep pushing that. that. People are trying to do good things, but I think we, to re-win people back, we need to have a National Anti-Corruption Commission. When I was leader, I didn't wait right, till the Somurex matter. I did this two and a half years ago. Sure, but I guess when you hear of the Adam Somurex, maybe you move a little more with a great deal more alacrity. Well, um, Minister, our problem was you... that we didn't win the election and it's up to the current government to implement uh, the anti-corruption commission. Bill Are you Shorten a fan talk... of the anti-corruption commission? When I hear Bill Shorten talking about, you know, branch taking in the Labor Party, I'm reminded of Captain Renault in Casablanca. Shocked, shocked to discover that gambling is going on. I mean, come on, Phil. I mean, really. Well, that's split an atom or two. <laughs> come on. Do you like the idea of an anti-corruption commission? Uh, we're committed to a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, so the Attorney General has made that very clear. We've uh, got which, uh, which decade? We've got plans for a uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission and we'll be taking them forward. Oh. That's another thing people don't like, is when we just don't answer questions. How does it appear to you, Sue Morfitt, from the, the business perspective when you see this going on? 
Oh, I think we're... Not, not we're, that your sector yeah. is pure as the driven snow from time to time <laughs> either. Not, no, it's not. But we're weary of it because... I think one of the really disappointing things about the last um, 15 years has been our considerable um, disenfra disen um, we're disenfranchised with the, the political process and, mm. and politicians in general. And this has been a real chance to build back so much of that trust and goodwill in a crisis. And it's just disappointing when we see this and we just, we just need to get rid of it so that we can, you know, so that we can shine. Can I, can, I, can I just pick, a, pick up on that point, Sue, because I think you make a very good point there. We, I think, as a country, and acknowledging we've seen a bit of a spike in Victoria, but I think there's a lot of work going into getting on top of that. But as a country, I think we are in a fortunate position that most Australians have a greater trust in institutions now than they did three or four months ago. They have seen governments, state and federal, come together. They've seen engagement across parties. Uh, they've seen the outstanding work of our health professionals at the front line. Uh, they've, they've seen um, a national focus on getting through this. And uh, I think as a nation, um, we can all uh, take some um, feeling that mm -hmm. collectively, collectively, I emphasise collectively, because I think just about every Australian has been involved in this, I mean, if you, we were talking about the app earlier, to have almost 6.5 million people All right, take an app uh, is extraordinary. Sure. Uh, let me move on. Um, our next question is here in the studio. It comes from Lisa Hanlon. As a teacher of young women, it is one of my roles to uh, guide and encourage these students as they choose a rich and rewarding career path. It is interesting to note that all of the panellists on this evening's panel and the host herself all hold a degree in the humanities, including arts, law and economics. One panellist has a degree in the science, but even she has a degree in education. So my question is, who will hold interesting and rigorous panel show debates in the future, let alone lead our nation, if the LNP goes ahead and guts the humanities? Yasmin, I'll start with you. I mean, I think the first ironic thing is that Minister Dan Teen is the one championing this policy who himself has an arts degree. The fact that the past four Prime Ministers also have arts degrees and it's one of the most popular qualifications in Parliament. Um, but, you know, speaking as a humanities student and studying law and international relations, I actually don't think it's very smart policy in general. When I was considering what degree I wanted to take, you know, the overall cost wasn't necessarily a factor because of HEX and the fact that I was looking at the degree and what my interests are and where I think it could take me. Um, and I also think it's important to, the, the reason why humanity is, is important and what the government is fundamentally misunderstanding is that it's also a place for critical thought. You know, for example, I've just started taking an environmental law elective. Does that necessarily mean I'll become an environmental lawyer? No. But it does reflect the fact that now I can look at the woeful government policy and understand perhaps where we could even fix it. I also think it reflects the fact that the government misunderstands what the job, what the job force actually looks like. I mean, young people are expected to have 17 different jobs across five different careers. It's no longer we just go to university and stick to that career path. So fundamentally, you know, absolutely humanity is important and it just reflects the fact that the government is not consulting with young people whatsoever. Engage with young, with young people, don't punish them. Katie Noonan, can I get you to jump in there? Ah, well, obviously for me, I'm one of the ones that has a Bachelor of Music in the Arts and I'm obviously in that sector. Um, uh, look, I'm not in the education sector and so I don't really feel... I, I mean, to my understanding, this process was... Is it true that it came together with consultation with the unis? I mean, there hasn't been much transparency into that um, process. I'd like to know more about how they got to those figures myself. Minister, there's some interesting analysis from the Mitchell Institute from Victoria University showing that getting a job has more to do with the level attained in the or tertiary education and little to do with the subject choice. So if you make it harder, if you make it more expensive to get that degree, how is your policy achieving your stated aim of making people job ready if the subject actually is immaterial but the level achieved is what you actually mm. want? Well, the rationale for the policy is to use in the economics jargon the price signal to help, I guess, inform students about choices they make. So, for example, there's been a substantial... So to dissuade people, you mean? Well, there's been... 60% of people will pay less or no more than today. So there's a substantial drop in what you'll pay for things like English, languages, 
uh, maths, can I, can IT. I take, can I take yeah. you to the question? It's the, the, the long dissertations are just um, you know chewing up time. The, the question being, if if the analysis well, shows that, 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 the, that the subject for the policy, no, but the subject the subject doesn't doesn't matter. But the level attained, and you're making it difficult for people to even get in or get that higher attained level. What, what you're asking me is why are we introducing this policy? And the reason is well, because can you achieve your stated aim? Is the question. Uh, well, we believe we can, which is why we're doing it. So the intention is to uh, essentially use the price signal to encourage students to choose degrees in areas that yeah. the evidence suggests will provide better job opportunities and a more uh, yeah. better prospect of, of employment. Bill Shorten? Uh, I think the policy... I weighed up using this term. It's not very elegant. I think their higher ed policy is a brain fart. I don't think it solves anything. <laughs> What happens is, essentially, and I'm a parent of two kids, one at uni, one at Year 12, um, uh, this is just... They're going to squeeze an extra 39,000 people into uni, which is good, for the same amount of money. So that means the price has to go up. Everyone knows universities become over-reliant on uh, overseas students. The bottom's fallen out of that market, and now it's part of some culture war that they're picking on an arts degree. I mean, the reality is mm. that 90% of graduates get jobs, 93% of... Arts graduates get jobs, so it's not about job ready. This is just a cost cutting in drag. We well, don't have to move on because we're very short of time Sorry now. But that. our next question comes from Holly Walker. Thank you. The grim reality in Australia is that one in three women experience sexual harassment at some point in their life, with the majority of that sexual harassment occurring in the workplace. As a recent graduate from law school, I'm terrified of the fact that at some point in my career, I'm probably going to be sexually harassed. What do you say to the women of Australia who are terrified and who are um, getting deterred from pursuing their dreams because of these fears? And what will you do to ensure that we're protected from predators like Dyson Hayden? I'll go right around the panel, but we'll have to be brief, I'm afraid. Sue Morford, I'll start with you. OK, we've just done some research. Um, first of all, uh, zero tolerance is absolutely the way that every business should be, every institution, every community body. Uh, so it's unacceptable. But uh, we've just done some research uh, and um, done some uh, work with WGIA, the uh, Women's uh, Gender Equity Information Agency, and it shows that where we have balanced, business, balanced teams, where we have more women, we have better culture, better understanding and we've got places where these sorts of things can be reported. OK. Bill Shorten. Uh, thanks, Holly. Um, first of all, I hope that it's changing for younger women now. I did a... After the Dyson Hayden story came out, um, someone smart said to me, I'll go and talk mm -hmm. to the women in your stuff because I was shocked. Not that harassment happens, but I just sort of thought, for whatever reason, and I had no science to it, the High Court, Top Court, couldn't happen there. So I... I shouldn't have been shocked. And this person said to me, go and ask your own staff and have they experienced it in their working lives? Um, some had, some hadn't. Everyone knew someone who had. What was interesting, though, is that the women under 30 had less direct experience of it. That doesn't mean that I think it's automatically safe. But what I do think is that gradually men and women, younger men and women, hopefully are changing their attitudes more. But I think Sue Morford answered the question, the best Still answer, up. zero tolerance. Katie Noonan. Obviously, I echo the, sec the sentiments of zero tolerance, but uh, for me, I just think we need more women. We need more women in positions of power. We need more women in parliament. I mean, I'm lucky I'm in Queensland. We have uh, the most number of women in ministerial roles in Australian history, I believe. And the Premier made a commitment to every single government board being f at least 50% female. And that uh, culture, you know, just makes a huge change. And um, I'd love to see more women as chairwomen, you know, deputy chairs, mm. and obviously more women in the ministerial roles of the LNP. Paul Fletcher, what would be your suggestion? Uh, look, it's uh, totally unacceptable. Everybody has a right to a safe workplace. And one of the things that troubled me most about what was reported last week was that I think at least three of the women involved had left the law after mm. uh, so many years of studying and getting to that point to be a High Court associate is very keenly contested. That's a great um, waste of uh, all of that effort and all of that human potential. I hope they will make a great contribution in other areas, but it shouldn't have happened. Yasmin? It's still happening. 
I haven't even graduated mm. yet and it's something that, you know, situations that have made me feel uncomfortable in mentorship settings, in networking settings. Um, and I've actually relied on other women usually to help get me out of that scenario. Have and they done so? Yes, yes, so they directed me away from a conversation and made me feel more comfortable. And as a law student, it's really heartbreaking to see that this has even happened in the highest legal institution mm. in Australia, mm. and it just mm. goes to show toxic attitudes towards power still remains embedded. Um, a good thing is, though, I guess, out of all of this, is, that the, is the High Court's response, um, legitimising and acknowledging survivors, mm. and I don't think it's a coincidence it was led by a female Chief Justice. I echo the sentiments, gender equal leadership is absolutely essential. It bears repeating, of course, that Dyson Hayden denied all allegations that have been made against him. Now, that's all that we have time for tonight, so please thank our terrific panel. Yasmin Poole, Paul Fletcher, Katie Noonan, Bill Shorten and Sue Morford. Thank you very much. And thanks to those of you here, our small but perfectly formed audience, and also at home for sharing your questions with us. And thanks uh, to you, those of you streaming us on iview. Now, Hamish will be back next week with a fabulous panel. Sean McAuliffe, Brooke Boney, Christopher Pine and Terry Butler. Don't miss that. And now it's only fitting that we leave you with our new way of listening to music since lockdown. Here's Katie Noonan with I Want to Dance with Somebody. I'll be back on ABC Radio Melbourne very soon. Enjoy, Katie, and good night. <laughs> The sun begins to fade Still enough time to figure out How to chase my blues away I've done right up to now It's a light of day that shows me how But when the night falls My loneliness goes so I want to dance with somebody I want to feel the heat with somebody yeah. I want to dance with somebody With somebody who loves me Oh, I want to dance with somebody I want to feel the heat with somebody yeah. I want to dance with somebody with somebody who loves me I've been in love and lost my senses spinning through the town sooner or later the fever ends and I wind up feeling down I need a Take a chance on a love that burns hot enough to last. So when the night falls, my lonely heart calls. Oh, I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel the heat with somebody. Yeah, I want to dance with somebody. With somebody who loves me Oh, I want to dance with somebody I want to feel the heat with somebody Yeah, I want to dance with somebody With somebody who loves me Somebody who Somebody who Somebody who loves me Somebody who, somebody who, to hold me in his arms. I need a man who'll take a chance on a love that burns hard enough to last. So when the night falls, my lonely heart calls.